Delighted to welcome you all to the Fleming tonight. I'm Janie Cohen, I'm director of the museum, and we are thrilled to have you here. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to thank our supporters for this evening's lecture. The University of Vermont's Humanity Center and UVM's Department of Art and Art History are both supporting us tonight. So. with us this evening, Alex Nemiroff, Department Chair and Carl and Marilyn Toma, Osteo Professor in the Arts and Humanities at Stanford University. Alex is one of the country's most esteemed art historians and a graduate of the University of Vermont. He received his BA in Art History and English from UVM in 1985, and his Master's and PhD in Art History from Yale. Alex taught at Stanford University from 1992 to 2000, and at Yale from 2001 until 2012, where he was named Vincent Scully Professor and Department Chair. In 2012, he returned to Stanford to take the distinguished positions that he currently holds. A scholar of American art, Alex is an outspoken and eloquent champion for the importance of the humanities in the academy and in our lives. He's a beloved teacher as well as a prolific writer and a noted speaker on the arts, committed to examining the history of art from a broad perspective. Alex's most recent books are Soul Maker, The Times of Living Time, published by Princeton University Press in 2016, and in 2015, Silent Dialogues, Dean Arvis and Howard Nemiroff. The latter explores resonances between the celebrated photographs of Alex's aunt and the Pulitzer Prize winning poetry of his father. This spring, Alex will deliver the 66th annual Andrew W. Miller Lectures in Fine Arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., one of the greatest honors offered to American art historians. Alex is with us this evening to speak on Edward Hopper's Bridal Path of 1939 particularly compelling painting in our current exhibition, Sergeant Sebastia, University of Vermont Alumni Collections. Please join me in a warm welcome for Alex Nimmeron. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all so much. Thank you, Jamie, for that nice warm introduction. Um, you know, this is a special occasion for me to come back to UVM. Um, I remember taking a class in this very same room back in 1985. It was an interdisciplinary class about Chaucer and the visual arts. And I was an art history and English major. And I can't say that many things I did were particularly wise when I was an undergraduate, but that was a very good choice for me because it completely predicts who I am to this day, which is I love to combine literature and art and, uh, and you know, I have never lost sight of the fact that my mentors here, some of whom are in this room right now, are so uh, patient and supportive of me and continue to have a lasting effect on who I am as a teacher and a scholar. So I'm one of these people who has the great good fortune of feeling in middle age to be so connected to my university, to where, where I um, was trained. And uh, every place on this campus is really meaningful to me and it's tremendous to be back. So thanks, UVM. <laughs> So, as Janie said, I want to talk about this great painting here called Bridal Path from 1939, which is here in this museum, and by Edward Hopper. And 
you know, it's uh, really, I suppose, what I want to talk about a lot tonight is um, how to look at a painting and how to unfold it and have it come alive historically uh, and also in the present. So, you know, it's a Central Park scene. This is the Dakota apartment building uh, above it. Um, this dates to the time when there were equestrian tracks in, in the park. And we see three figures, one man um, and then two women on horseback about to ride through this tunnel. The man is nearest to us on a white horse, its head being um, reared back. Uh, there's a woman in smart riding attire directly next to him. And then somewhat of an outlier, her horse with all four legs contracted underneath the belly in the manner um, discovered by the 19th century photographer Edward Moybridge in his motion photography is somewhat off to the side. They, uh, it seems as though the white horse is, is rearing up perhaps at the prospect of entering this tunnel. Um, its rearing head is echoed in the rocks here for example, there and there and there to give a sense of um, a kind of exaggeration of its attitude. Um, and when I look at this picture, as we just sketch in its themes, I guess I think a lot of the pun in the title, for me at least, Bridal Path, um, you could, it makes me think of bridal as in B-R-I-D-A-L, and it makes me think of the couple and it makes me think of the triangle between the three figures and something, I don't know if it's misanthropic, but there's something acerbic, let's say, about the man on the white horse about to enter this tunnel on this bridal path uh, with this one woman. And then there's meanwhile the other figure over here. Two trees twine like so as if to speak to the connectedness of these two figures. And then right on cue, there is a separate tree to track with her. So let's just think about this, you know, take that in, but then think about this as coming from one of Edward Hopper's most famous and productive years. And I'm just going to show you the pictures he made that spring and summer and into the early fall in succession. He made this painting in April of 1939. This is a painting he made in May, June. Uh, it's really, as I recall, the very next one after Bridal Path. It's the painting called New York Movie, which you can see at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And it shows his wife, Josephine, or Joe, J-O, as she was called. She posed uh, in a separate, I believe she posed in the hallway of their apartment building in New York as the usherette. And then meanwhile, there is uh, the movie going on. There's the black and white, the silver screen there. So the painting that's here in this museum is part of an illustrious connection with this picture. And then this painting is the next one he made, which he made in July of 1939. It's one you, some of you may have seen at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. It's called Cape Cod Evening. And like New York movie, it is composited from different studies, for example, um, studies of this doorway then appended to studies of another Cape Cod house, Cape Cod being where the hoppers spent a lot of time. And then in this picture, which was originally called the Whippoorwill, uh, as if to indicate the sudden sound that has made the collie's ears perk up, um, this scene seems to be uh, portraying some subtle state of dysfunction or uh, discord between the standing woman and the sitting man. The man identified with the collie somehow, both of their legs disappearing in the long sea of grass. The, um, the borderline between, you know, order and symmetry and, you know, chaos, the woods, uh, being ever so subtly um, crossed by one of the, the um, branches of that tree. In August and September of 1939, Hopper made this painting called um, Groundswell, 
which for many years was at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C., and then when that museum became defunct, went into the National Gallery. So you can see it there with the picture I just showed you. This was a painting that Hopper made as World War, World War II began in Europe. Um, he started it on August 15th. He, he finished it on September 15th. You'll know that the Blitzkrieg into Poland started on September 1st. In any case, it wouldn't seem to have anything to do with that. It's another Cape Cod scene, a kind of Indian summer scene of one, two, three men, all shirtless, a woman here, and probably a fifth figure denoted by that head, all uh, solemnly staring at and listening to the uh, bell on this buoy that their cat boat passes narrowly amid these peculiar shelf-like waves. And then just to round out that year's production, Hopper did something unusual, which is he took a commission, and he was very begrudging about it, but he took a commission to paint the home of the actress and radio star of that time, Helen Hayes, uh, a, a house in Nyack, New York, which is where Hopper was from, a house that I believe is now owned by Rosie O'Donnell or was recently. Uh, it, is called, it is called the house and the painting are called Pretty Penny and um, which has a, a, a ring not only in, in being true to the name of the house, but also in terms of the commission that Hopper received. Um, this is a painting you can see at uh, the Smith College Museum of Art. And, you know, it, it seems to be more prosaic than one of the ones, some of the ones I've shown you already, but there are, there are weirdnesses to it. For example, the way these trees come down here or these, these branches. So that gives you a sense of the, the uh, flow that this picture here in this museum tonight inaugurates. Uh, but I want to uh, pursue now a little bit more closely this picture and say something about the tunnel. <laughs> um, you know, several of the paintings we've looked at before, and particularly Cape Cod Evening, have a, a kind of uh, relationship there there's a question of relationships there and if you accept this idea of the pun of the bridal or bridal path and even if you we even if the picture were titled something totally different there would be a sense that these two figures are going into this darkness and you know it made me think of in the essay i wrote for this um book here the the tunnel of love or tunnels of love as in coney island amusement parks that were a part of Hopper's New York. However, to speak to the, the comparison came to me chiefly as a, as, a, as a manner of distinction between an amusement park like this and the painting Hopper uh, made. In other words, if this is a kind of, um, I don't know, not lascivious, but kind of a chance to, I'll just say, neck with your uh, <laughs> beloved, um, the Hopper painting feels, if, if it too is a kind of tunnel of love, feels much more um, repressed or cautious or genteel or all of those things. It's, it's a kind of more, um, a tunnel of love for the upper crust, let's call it, right? And to, to, to emphasize that, let me just say something about the artists who portrayed, um, let's just call, call it like equestrian-based uh, Affection. That's not a very good term, but, but I did just drive from New York, so okay. So check it out. Um, this is a painting by Reginald Marsh, who um, was a little younger than Hopper, but who, unlike Hopper, did not spend time making pictures in New York of, um, you know, um, the kind of reserved and dislocated uh, social stresses and psychological stresses that we've given, been given a glimpse of, but more the kind of ribald, um, physical, like unapologetically sensuous uh, couplings and decouplings that you could find at amusement centers such as Coney Island. And this is Marsh's picture from 1932 of a ride there called George Tilliou's Steeplechase, which is, as I understand it, is a track with these, not a, not a merry-go-round exactly, but a, um, you know, a fast-moving, kind of dizzying uh, 
uh, ride in which you could ride alone or ride with your date and um, uh, circle on these on these um, ersatz or artificial horses. And in this one, the sailor is you know grabbing, holding on from behind his his uh, his you know I mean this this is a kind of frankly sexual picture so. He is mounting her as she is mounting the horse. And it is, you know, in this Rubensian way, um, Peter Paul Rubens being someone who is, you know, clearly on, on Marsh's mind, uh, is about, you know, an exploration of this darkened kind of chiaroscuro of, um, you know, desire and uh, one night stands and um, a kind of loose frilled or frilly um, gartered uh, kind of floozyism, let's call it. <laughs> yeah. Notice, like when you when when paintings require you to kind of torture or bend your language, it's usually a good sign, because you know words words and pictures don't match really. That's one of the things one notices after you know departing from UVM and starting as a teacher and been doing it for 25 years is, uh, you know, they don't match. So usually when they're, you feel the not matching is a good sign. So yes, yeah, so this is 1932. As I said, it's actually at the Smithsonian. Um, this is a, a Saturday Evening Post cover from April 1935, not by Norman Rockwell, but by one of his rival or co-illustrators for that publication, an um, um, artist named M.L. Bauer, B-O-W-E-R, which, you know, I think in the true manner of Saturday Evening Post of sort of hedging its bets between the, the, the sort of vulgar and the fine and the safe, <laughs> um, trying to appeal to all parties and to each party's taste for both of those phenomena, uh, that is to feel kind of comfortable and prudent and puritanical as well as very interested in the things one professes to abhor. Um, <laughs> this scene of, um, you know, devil, devil, I don't know, daredevil riders at the circus um, keeps the woman and the man uh, discreetly apart, not only um, you know, um, well, there he's further back. Um, he seems curiously tiny in this, I suppose, um, but also allows you to imagine that this is a kind of um, I don't know. It's erotic. It's an erotic thing having to do with horses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. When we, you know, we're still thinking about bridal path here. Don't worry, I'm not, I'm not going off the rails. I mean, so 1939, you know, I always like to think of what has happened in a particular year. And so 1939, which is the year of bridal path, and we know is such a tremendous year for Hopper. It's also a great year in Hollywood, probably the ultimate year in Hollywood when you think of all the fantastic films that were made. That year, um, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, the young Mr. Lincoln, the Wizard of Oz, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Those are just four that come to mind, but also, of course, Gone with the Wind. And, you know, in thinking about this lecture, I was thinking, OK, um, I know that the hopper feels kind of repressed and cautious. And, and, you know, the tunnel of love is something to shy from or to be very prim and proper about. Uh, where are there scenes of horses in Gone with the Wind? And if there are such scenes, and I quickly remember that they are there in the Burning of Atlanta sequence, what is the connotation of them? So you'll recall from the film, and for maybe a few of you who've read Margaret Mitchell's best-selling 1936 novel, uh, the Union Army is coming through Atlanta. The Confederates are blowing up the munitions depot. Depots. Scarlet desperately wants to get back to Tara. Red is the only person who can give her a hand. Um, and he steals a horse and tries to get her on her way, though he famously abandons her and leaves her to navigate to Tara on her own. So I wanted to go straight to Mitchell's text and see the kind of erotic language here, because I just had a theory, you know, that 
that the flames would have something to do with the relationship between Rhett and Scarlett. So uh, then there was a crash of falling timbers nearby, and Scarlett saw a thin tongue of flame lick up over the roof of the warehouse in whose sheltering shadow they sat. So that's a warm up. Um, then, a glare brighter than a dozen suns dazzled their eyes, scorching heat seared their skins, and the roaring, crackling, and crashing beat upon their ears in painful waves. For an eternity, it seemed, they were in the midst of flaming torment, and then abruptly they were in semi-darkness again. Then his arms went around her waist and shoulders, and she felt the hard muscles of his thighs against her body and the buttons of his coat pressing into her breast. A warm tide of feeling, bewildering, frightening, swept over her, carrying out of her mind the time and place and circumstances. She felt as limp as a rag doll, warm, weak, and helpless, and his supporting arms were so pleasant. So you probably like my curation of Gone with the Wind slides to illustrate that. So, you know, it's not a surprise that a Technicolor epic um, from Hollywood would have um, a great deal to say about the flames of passion, that the Hayes Code, the code of ethics being what it was, nonetheless, no no um, holds would be spared to portray the flame of the lust and love between Rhett and Scarlet. These are William Cameron Menzies' um, production uh, drawings, which Selznick, the producer, was able to follow meticulously. And incidentally, the burning of Atlanta was the very first scene made in the whole film because they they did a twofer where they, they knew they were going to burn down some sets to make new sets for Gone with the Wind, and so they, they did that as the burning of Atlanta. So next time you see that movie, remember that that's the first thing they did. It was in November of 38. But in any case, it was all planned out well before in 1937. Menzies, um, production designer, beautiful drawings. And these pictures then come into play for me as if we're talking about love in the 1930s or if we're talking about the difference between Hopper's conception of love and uh, Hollywood's conception uh, take on take on a vivid contrast right I mean this this you know if you didn't know what it illustrated you would say it was a kind of tic-tac-toe of desire you know it was um, something that um, portrayed anguished states of erotic eruption, explosions, love and war, as Tolstoy and Dickens both knew so well, go together um, perfectly. But it raises a question, too, about, um, you know, more specifically about the difference between Hopper and Hollywood. And I just wanted to pursue that. I mean, this is very tricky. This gets at something that's hard to describe about Hopper to this day, which is that he's popular and it's kind of high art too. And I just want to position Hopper in that way by asking you to think of him first in relation to Hollywood a little further. So here's a great black and white photograph showing Gone with the Wind in production. And there's Vivian Lee as Scarlet. Uh, Atlanta hasn't been set on fire yet, but it is chaos. The Union Army is approaching and you know, teams of sound men and cameramen, these men employed to move the extremely heavy um, Technicolor camera uh, are poised all around Scarlet. When I look at Hopper paintings like this great one called Summertime from 1943, again, you want to think of paintings and films as utterly different. But I think there is a Hollywood dimension to Hopper's paintings. And although, you know, we can't imagine him, you know, with the painterly equivalent of sound mics and heavy technicolor cameras all around here, we can imagine him, I think, staging paintings like this, paintings of his heroines, very much, I think, almost, 
I don't know how conscious it was, but I was going to say almost as though he really was taking a model as a model the Hollywood that is portrayed in New York movie, for example, so that, you know, Selznick is the grand producer of Gone with the Wind and Hopper you could think of as the producer of his paintings. And I'm not necessarily criticizing him. I'm just saying there's something very um, Hollywood like about his pictures, not just in their subject matter, but in the way you can imagine him staging them. So that's one way to understand Hopper as somehow between the high art, the exaltation of high art and popular culture. Here's, a, here's another way. Well, you know, if you look at, if you look at uh, another one of William Cameron Man Menzies drawings, this one, of course, of um, Scarlet here at Tara in the pre-war days, you know, I would say Bridal Path too has this Mm, it, it, it feels related to a kind of Hollywood scenography where um, a scene is not just painted, but is kind of staged and uh, staged with an idea of its narrative accessibility in the manner of a film. But here's another way to understand Hopper and to kind of position him in terms of the high low world of the 30s and maybe now. This is a painting by Norman Rockwell, who was, of course, extremely famous by then and went on with a very illustrious career at the Saturday Evening Post all the way till 1962, when he um, was forced out of, of um, illustrating for that magazine. But this is from 1937, and it's called The Road Painter's Problem. And it's done up here in the image you see prior to the, you know, it's not the actual cover, but it's the prep for the cover. What is the road painter's problem? Well, um, you can see that his painstaking work to create the straight lines by which the rules of not just the road, but of society govern or run uh, is ruined by this animal escapade down underneath his bottom uh, and the, the dog chasing the cat. And, when I look at this, I think very much of it as a, as a statement about what else? About painting. You know, that it's not literally, uh, it doesn't literally show Rockwell painting, but it, to me at least, is a way for Rockwell to comment on his own status as a painter. And it is, it's a kind of, there's a kind of tomfoolery to it. Rockwell was a very melancholy guy. He was much more complicated, I think, than an idea of dismissing him as just a popular illustrator would suggest. Um, you know, he knew how to make an appealing cover, he knew how to make an appealing design, he knew how to get a good laugh, he knew how to be instantly legible, and he also knew how to loathe himself for doing all of that stuff, you know. And this figure, without, of course, being a literal representation of Rockwell, feels like the aversion of the painter as buffoon. The painter whose job it is to create the rules of culture, a kind of normative world of rules and regulations, who, whose best work is, goes awry because of the animal desires, either of his own, his own animal desires, um, or um, those of the culture at large, or both. Now look at, look at the way Hopper imagines himself as a painter. Again, not literally, but this is a painting by Hopper from 1952 called House by the Railroad. It's at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington. House, or I'm sorry, Hotel by the Railroad. And, and you know, what we have here literally is a, a man and a woman, husband and wife, have checked into a hotel, a cheap hotel by the railroad. There are the tracks. This is a big window. The man looks out, smokes a cigarette. His wife reads a book sitting in the chair. When I see this painting, I always think of him as a painter. And of course, I'm mistaken, I'm, but then I feel like I'm also kind of right, that it's this figure standing here in front of this rectangle, which is a view of the world, and who holds, you know, as well as a cigarette, a cigarette, I guess, that is also very brush-like. And if you think about this as, as, a, as a statement about who Hopper believes he is as a painter, it's a, not surprising. It's a student of the geometry of American loneliness, um, the four squares of solitude, and um, kind of beautiful despair, 
that can be found to this day, I assure you, in many American locations, um, who is kind of connected to a support system, but is also a, a kind of heroic solitary. So look, when, there's two, when you see these two pictures together, you can see, I think, some of the different self-conceptions of the painter, of being a painter in each of these works. Rockwell, as I spoke of, the, the slapstick uh, entertainer, uh, the gag smith, and then this more refined uh, figure here. So if Hopper is kind of related, not related to Hollywood, he's also, I would say, different from Rockwell, you know? He's on a much, he imagines himself to be, and he is catering to a different kind of audience than Rockwell, and here's a way to see that. You know, if you look at a newsstand from that time, I suppose newsstands look like this now, but not also not like this. I mean, this is a Berenice Abbott photograph from 1935, just um, almost like a altarpiece of popular culture, the, the um, the, the, the infinity of options, all options being, of course, very similar, but nonetheless, the, the appearance of plenitude and endless possibilities, which I suppose uh, turn around the 1,000 channels of cable is the equivalent of now. But if you look at, say, you know, what it's like to look at a hopper in a museum, like in this museum, as against going to a newsstand, you understand all the more distinctly the difference between Rockwell and Hopper. So we're finding a very, very subtle way to differentiate Hopper from the popular culture that he's nonetheless in dialogue with and is, is more related to, certainly, than, say, Jackson Pollock or someone like that. And here's another uh, way to understand that is to bring in a figure who I first learned about at UVM, uh, who I feel was like Hopper in terms of bridging um, popular culture and high, high art, and that's Ernest Hemingway. And this is a story I first read here called The Short Happy Life of Francis Macomber, which when I thought about this talk, it just popped into my head almost for the first time since I took an English class in Lafayette back in 1983. And you know, you can see, um, this is an illustration by a, a man named Dean Cornwell, and it shows the denouement of the story. Uh, you would never guess that this woman who looks so totally concerned and is Francis McComber's wife has just shot him in the back of the head with a massive uh, shotgun that could bring down a, you know, a bull, in, a bull, uh, buffalo, um, you know. Um, this is the hunter she has just, she's been sleeping with. Um, and Macomber, who's now dead, has had a, suffered in the classic Hemingway fashion, has chickened out at the last moment when a lion had been rushing him. And therefore, his wife takes a dim view and sleeps with the hunter who manfully kills the beast. Then, just bear with me, then um, the next day, after he's been cuckolded, uh, Macomber recovers his manly form and is a picture of bravery and is just about to dispatch a charging beast when his wife accidentally on purpose shoots him in the head <laughs> from the car. But that's not what I remembered. That's not what I remembered from my UVM class, OK? I remembered my professor talking about the the um, position of the figures in the, in the safari truck as they drove out to that last hunt. And it was all about the symbolism of who's in the driver's seat. And that's what made me start to think about bridal path. So, you know, this is a passage from Hemingway. He climbed, from the story, he climbed into the front with the driver, so he being Wilson, the, the English hunter, and Francis McComber and his wife sat not speaking in the back seat. There was a heavy dew, and as the wheels went through the grass and low bushes, he could smell the odor of the fresh fronds. It was an odor like verbena, and he liked this early morning smell of the dew, the crushed bracken, and the look of the tree trunks showing black through the early morning mist as the car made its way through the untracked park-like countries. By the way, it, it's a great story. <laughs> I mean, I'm, and you know why it is? Um, it's because it's so brutal. I mean, just unbelievable. No, but I say that in seriousness, that um, there's no euphemism 
Um, the lion's experience of being shot in the face is described from the lion's point of view. Um, and it's so unsparing. It makes you realize how cautious and euphemistic so much literature was then and is now. Uh, so, you know, here is the Cornwell picture now, the color picture, and it's obviously worlds away from Hopper, but somehow, you know, Hemingway is crossing over between mass culture that this story appeared in Cosmopolitan magazine and then was put out in a refined group of short stories, a publication of short stories not long after. Um, you know, he has his own neg negotiation with this popular high combination and Hopper has his own. Um, and there would seem to be the point of the comparison, except for one other thing that relates to Bridal Path. And it's just this, that, uh, you know, there's no, um, you know, there's no big hunt in, in Hopper's work, really. You know, Hopper, there's Hemingway on his 1935 African safari, which led to the writing of the story I've just been discussing. And here's Hopper, um, you know, so the only trophies he has are his, uh, stove and, you know, uh, various other implements of um, beautiful American artisanal design. So Hopper is worlds away from Hemingway, but there, when I think about the, the manliness in Bridal Path and in the, and in the Hemingway story, I feel you know, ever so subtly, there is something of Hemingway or something like Hemingway in Bridal Path. How so? Well, look at this painting from the Renaissance. So um, I noticed that there is a copy of Donatello's St. George um, here uh, in the hall upstairs. And this is a picture of St. George slaying the dragon in 1530 painting by a Venetian painter named Paris Bordonian. And you might say, okay, that's fine. Here is the damsel who is uh, saved by St. George. But when I look at this, you know, and this is just a rough comparison, but what I focus on here is the confrontation with this big black mouth here in the hopper. And my understanding of how pictures work is that they kind of carry through them, kind of smoke through their atmosphere, not just explicit references back and forth to paintings the artist has in mind, his own or others, but also a whole history of art that if you're a good artist like Hopper, you can't help but find in your mind and in your shoulder and your elbow and your wrist. And it just kind of makes its way in. And when I think of this picture, I think there's a very kind of muted sense, but still discernible to me at least, of the hunt in this and of questions of prowess and questions of physical bravery as they relate to sex and romance and commitment. Um, uh, you know, and it's all, of course, left unsaid and unresolved, but you know, to me, it, it gives a little bit of a kind of mythic or um, uh, a mythic dimension to the, the couple's confrontation with that, that tunnel. Let's come back, though, to this painting, Roundswell, though, and think about it in relation to Bridal Path for a moment. Um, I mentioned it was made just as World War II was beginning, and again, that it seems to have nothing to do with that. But as I look at these Cape Cod um, sailors, I mean, this is something I've written about, this picture. And, you know, I, when, the more I started to think about this odd scenario, which I've sketched out before, which is why, why this almost kind of preternatural staring at this buoy, you know, as though it's um, indicative of something, you know. And, of course, it's never said what it is, but um, on this bright, day with the cirrus clouds flowing through there and you know it's hard to say but one thing I found is you know there was a huge hurricane some of you will know this from history uh, in 1938 that swept through the East Coast and for example put downtown Providence Rhode Island under many feet of water 
for this is 1938, this is 1939. Look at the New York Times, hurricane sweeps coasts, etc. So remember, this is called groundswell. And what I was interested in with these Times headlines, so this is September 1938, is not just the hurricane headline, but the pairing of it with what's going on in Europe. Czechoslovakia decides to give up, crowds protest, cabinet in peril, Chamberlain to demand guarantees. So this is the annexation of the Sudetenland by Hitler. That's on September 22nd. September 23rd, Chamberlain meets Hitler, talks to continue today, new government in Prague. And then, meanwhile, matchingly, storm toll, 462, thousands homeless, 250 killed in the Providence area, New England still battles floods. It's this twinning or combination between a political disaster and a natural disaster that I feel provides something of the backstory for this picture that is about this swelling tide with this ominously sounding bell and this poised dark um, mass that alone interrupts the bluescape of the rest of the picture. And it's, that helped me to understand a little bit why these figures are seem, staring at it almost beyond belief as sailors, but instead seem to give it some sort of um, you know, existential uh, vividness. And there's another way I thought of this too, which is just thinking of those figures, looking at it, you know, it reminded me of the, the entertainment of that era, which in addition to movies was, of course, newspapers, magazines, but also radio. And, you know, so much news from abroad was carried in waves uh, from Europe in those days. Um, you know, the, the very uh, political situations I've just been describing attracted uh, record listenership um, among Americans. And... There's some way that this picture feels related to all of that. Um, not just because Marconi established the first transatlantic uh, radio communication from Cape Cod of all places, but just somehow in the vibe of this picture. And it makes me then come back to Bridal Path and ask the, the fundamental question, which is what do these two very different paintings have to do with one another? And you know, on one level, the answer would be nothing at all, but they're both co-educational pictures of leisure that are somehow fraught. The, um, the, black, the black tunnel becomes more vivid now by virtue of its kinship with the buoy here. And without, you know, making literal diagrams or journalistic illustrations of anything, uh, Hopper is nonetheless basically dealing, dealing in the same plot here, the same narrative of a group of figures confronting some, some, some reason for trepidation, some kind of caution. Um, groundswell is such a great populist term as well as a nautical term, right? I mean, uh, a groundswell of public opinion, Father Coughlin, um, FDR, um, what is the public, which way are we swaying? Which way are we going back and forth here? What is, what is the call? What is the news? It's not unlike now where every day there's a new uh, wave and a new sway and so on. Here, the energies of this picture, you see the white cat boat, it's kind of deep, rounded belly sloping like this. It's very much in kinship with the white horse. And you could say, too, that, um, you know, Hopper knows how to design a picture, though that's the tree, you know, th things appear in, in both of them. And they somehow seem, not surprisingly, made by the same mind in the same set of months and with the same kind of general but serious preoccupations governing both. So somehow love and war, war and love are bound together in these genteel scenarios. So when I go to Central Park, you know, without photographing the exact tunnel, which I confess to not being keen enough to try to figure out, um, and also believing in Hopper's um, pastiching of different scenes into one, uh, you know, I'm nonetheless struck by these tunnels as they look now. 
And, you know, what is the import of going to a place like this now? I was thinking about this, um, again, with pertinence to today. Um, you know, I think it's, it's about the power of fiction, you know, because if you, if you go to a spot like this, a go-to take on it, I know it can be for me as well as I'm sure for many of you, can be, that's right, that's wrong. Or that, he did that right, and that's wrong, you know, or then we can maybe throw in a, just a little bit of, like, poetic license, but basically anything else is just wrong, you know, and, and that, that makes me sad <laughs> when, when we think like that, because in addition to those two categories of right and wrong, there is this third term, and it's called fiction, you know, and fiction, and this is an important thing to remember now, and when we think about the humanities being embattled everywhere and so on, fiction is not falsehood. You know, there's not a word that is quote unquote true in, say, war and peace, <laughs> but you read it for life itself. And, you know, this notion of the fictional, the made up, the thing that departs from life, that takes it only as a kind of predicate or starting point and then goes on to illuminate a world that could only exist in that one painting, and which is a fiction of life, not a falsehood of life, a fiction of life. This seems to me of the essence when we think about what an artist like Hopper has to give us. And, you know, he was a person like any serious artist of many fictions and a kind of evolving sense of fiction in his work. So this is a painting some of you may have seen um, it's in the Phillips collection in Washington, D.C., and it seems very much of a sister painting to the one here in this museum now. It's called Approaching a City, and it was painted in 1946. And you look at it, and, you know, it is obviously coming into a city on the train, and it's so existentially drained of all the uh, he said, she said um, drama of, or sexual intrigue or romantic intrigue that we saw with um, Bridal Path. And instead it's kind of pared down to this, I don't know what you'd want to call it, a more human or elemental or like Dostoevskian um, or even Melvillian, let's say, um, feeling of confronting the abyss or the unknown. Not without its noir, its Hollywood noir, its sort of Bogart-like um, sense of when you approach a city, this is this is what it's like when you approach a city. It's not going to, um, you know, the Hard Rock Cafe. It's going down into a subterranean world. And so, you know, just last, when you look at these paintings together, you know, 1939, 1946, I don't know if it's the war that causes the change in perception, if this kind of post-Auschwitz, post-Hiroshima painting is necessarily pared down and the, the anecdote and narrative that so beautifully characterize this picture need to be dispensed with. A quick survey of Hopper's work after World War II would suggest that that probably is not totally accurate because he did go on painting figures and romantic intrigue and dysfunction. But nonetheless, this, this comparison does illustrate something about the two modes of the fictional that Hopper had at, at his disposal at this, in these years. And um, neither one is, if you like, like life or is to be thought of as having its worth only in its relation to life. Both are um, different poetic strands uh, for an artist who could tell stories perhaps better than almost any other. Thank you. Thank you.